Hello, and welcome to Raise Your Average. I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor at AdvisorAnalyst.com. My co-hosts are Mike Philbrick and Adam Butler, Principals at Resolve Asset Management, SEZC. Joining us today is Corey Hofstein, co-founder and chief investment officer at Boston-based Newfound Research, a quantitative tactical asset management firm. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Great to have you. How are things where you are? Well, I actually snuck away out of the States. Uh, my wife and I were living in Venice and knowing these fine gentlemen at Resolve Asset Management, they said, hey, come on down to Cayman. It's beautiful here. And so uh, Cayman was offering up this thing they're calling the, the Global Citizens Program. You can apply to come live here for a year and they're just looking for tourists that are willing to move. So my wife and I applied picked up in January and have been living in Grand Cayman ever since, which is for people who ask me what it's like, I sort of say it's like, that's like asking what going to Disney World is like when no one's there. It's like, of course, it's amazing. There's no tourists. You get the beaches to yourself, but it's certainly not reality as far as I can tell. So amazing. Good fun. So we got two, so two you, CIOs for the price of one today, Pierre. I'm impressed. <laughs> that's too many egos in the room. That's the problem. <laughs> Well, Maybe. I mean, you, you, you did great getting through the tongue twister that is uh, Corey's corporation and his his uh, uh, investment tactics. That's for sure. That was <laughs> that was a beauty. I give you credit for that. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to do that. Well, what will be tomorrow in this timeline, but yeah. it'll be tomorrow when this is released. But I have to do that tomorrow for him. So I can empathize. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, Corey, for the benefit of those who aren't familiar with you, please tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. What inspired you to get into the financial business in the first place? Your, your background, where you began, um, what you're working on these days at Newfound. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I always like to say that I got into this industry absolutely by accident. I had no intention of ending up here. I I consider myself a, a middle of the road millennial, so sort of that Super Nintendo generation. And like most young male millennials, I thought I'd make video games for a living. So I actually originally went to university for computer science, quickly realized that while I loved programming and all that sort of stuff, uh, a, a career in it probably wasn't for me. And this was pre-2008, and among all of my peers, everyone was going into iBanking and sales and trading. And so I started to get interested in finance, and it was just sort of through this combination of, I've got this background in computer science, I'm meeting a lot of people who are doing fundamental investing. There seemed to me to be an interesting marriage there uh, that I started to get really keen on the idea of systematic investing. Where I say I got really lucky was once I sort of found that marriage, I knew I wanted to go do some sort of derivatives trading type career. I applied to go to Carnegie Mellon's computational finance program and, and was uh, thankfully accepted. So I was going to do that right after my undergrad. But before that, ended up getting introduced to a local asset manager through my father's financial advisor, who was keen on some of the research I was putting together, asked if he could license it. And I said, great, I'm a broke college student, could absolutely use the beer money, set up this company, Newfound Research. Uh, it was named Newfound because that was a lake I used to go to in New Hampshire, research uh, yeah. because it was a research firm. And I assumed it would be gone within a year. Uh, had no idea, you know, close to, I guess, 13 years later, still here, still doing it. But the good news was, was post 2008, a lot of the research I was doing, which was around tactical asset allocation, had a lot of interest. So while I was in grad school, this business just sort of accidentally took off. And I said, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to pursue something entrepreneurial. And so that's exactly what I did. And the rest is history, as they say. So yeah, what does Newfound it, do today? What does Newfound do today? That's a, that's a great question, Adam. Thank you. So 
so what we like to say is that newfound we're we've converted from research towards a more traditional asset management firm we aim to help investors proactively navigate the, the risks of investing our core thesis of how we do that is the best way to manage risk is with diversification but we think investors need to think more holistically around what diversification means so it's not just what you're investing in but it's also how you're making those investment decisions and when you're making them and our goal is to introduce products and strategies that can help investors further diversify that how and when axis of their investments oh what a great segue so so let take yeah. let's take take uh, go, go down that path as well so what do you mean by diversifying across the how and the when sure so i would call what based diversification so the three axes we think of are, are what which is what are you investing in so that's going to be your traditional asset allocation type process how you're investing is going to capture this idea of process diversification so Adam, I know you would think of this, having read many of your papers and discussed with you, this would be sort of an ensemble of different processes. This can be in something as simple as, are you making certain stylistic tilts within equities, right? Is it value versus momentum? Uh, to even something as nuanced as, well, how are you measuring value? And those sort of tilts and process changes in terms of how you're accessing an asset class can introduce different types of diversification into the portfolio, and then the ways in which they're implemented can also diversify each other. Yep, that sounds good. And then what about the um, the when? I know you've written some papers, and, and actually this is kind of a point of pride for you. I think you you definitely have cottoned on to the the when diversification um, before yeah, I don't... it caught the attention more broadly. And I think some good examples here would really um, highlight just how important and, and large an effect this can be. Yeah, I don't know whether it should be a point of pride. Sometimes I feel a bit like uh, Don Quixote tilting at windmills with this one. No one seems to care. But when based diversification to me is this huge risk that everyone completely ignores. I've actually only seen one other paper written about it. Uh, it was by a couple gentlemen at Robico written in 2010. And the basic idea is really simple. It just basically says when you choose to make an investment decision, can have a rather profound impact on the returns you realize. And it seems to be something that's well recognized in the world of private equity, but not something that seems to carry over into public markets very much. So let, I'll give a really simple example in private equity and then sort of translate it into public markets. In private equity, there's this common idea of, of making sure you allocate across multiple vintages of exposure because when you allocate, say, to one private equity fund in a given year, you're very susceptible to what's happening in the economic cycle at that point in time. And so what people look to do is smooth out that economic cycle exposure by allocating a little bit to a fund this year, a little bit to a fund next year, and so on and so forth, recycling that capital over time so that they're less susceptible to that sort of start date of when they invested. It's not really something that's done in public markets all that much, but as it turns out, that same concept has a ton of impact. So really simple, let's say we have two investors, right? Adam, me and you, right? And, and let's say we're both building value portfolios and we're doing it systematically. So you and I have a formula by which we are picking value stocks. And let's say we come up with the exact same formula. So you and I have a, have a recipe we follow, and at the end of every quarter, we pick stocks. And the only difference in the process is that I happen to rebalance the middle of the quarter. So every sort of uh, sixth week of the quarter, I end up running the process and pick that basket of stocks and buy it and hold it for the next three months. You, on the other hand, wait till the end of quarter follow the exact same process but what happens is because you're doing it six weeks after me or six weeks before me depending on your frame of reference you're actually going to pick a subtly different set of securities and even though we're following the exact same recipe that difference in what you pick can end up leading to really meaningful differences in the actual uh, portfolio performance 
Now, for very slow moving portfolios where the recipe doesn't change the securities you pick very frequently, not a big deal. But something like momentum stocks, if you're having a momentum portfolio, well, you and I might end up with entirely different stocks that we pick. And the performance dispersion at the end of the year can be hundreds to thousands of basis points. And so as allocators and investors look to evaluate the performance of managers, if they're not aware of trying to condition for this when-based diversification element or realize how much dispersion it can actually create between managers, they might actually think something's alpha when in reality they just had sort of beneficial timing luck in when they yeah. happened to allocate. Yeah, so like if you started uh, March 24th last year versus someone versus manager B starting August of last year, the difference would be difference could be massive. They could have very similar ideas about investing. Imagine but, a financial advisor yeah. who just has a 60-40 allocation for a client and rebalances once a year. And they yeah. just happen to do it at the end of every March. They look like a genius in 2008 and they look like a genius last year versus another manager or advisor who does the same thing but just happens to rebalance in September or December. They're going to end up having worse performance despite having an identical process. Yeah, and would you refer to that as base effects or or would you be I call it timing luck. Yeah. Um I haven't really yeah. come up with a better phrase for it. And I think the problem with saying calling it timing luck is there's a lot of people who say, well, you shouldn't time the market. When in reality, mm -hmm. I think any time you implement an investment decision, there is a timing element to it. You can't avoid timing, right? The the arrow of time moves in one direction. And whether you elect to allocate today, tomorrow, or a month from now, that's going to have an impact on the opportunity set and sort of uh, the ultimate returns that you realize. Yeah, it goes to that quote um, Nancy Davis used in uh, a previous episode of Raise Your Average, where she said her, her one of her favorite quotes was Warren Buffett's quote that you make your money when you buy the stock, not when you sell it. It certainly has yeah. a, a profound impact. When, yeah. when you make these investment choices um, is important. And I think it's something that got totally overlooked in the last decade where passive indexed ETFs really took off. These systematic strategies really took off. And a lot of allocators moved from traditional active to systematic active that happens to rebalance on a very fixed schedule. And you yeah. start to see investors cross compare. Well, this value ETF did better than this other value ETF. And they don't realize that a lot of that dispersion might just be because, you know, this one rebalanced in June and energy stocks looked really good in June versus the other one rebalanced in December and energy just wasn't even there. And that can, yeah. you know, should they get credit for just that randomness? Probably not. Yeah. So, so one of the just, ways that you address this in your um, in your research is this idea of tranching. Can you maybe go through that and um, how that can have yeah. a positive effect? You know, the way I address this, and this is not, this was actually not my idea, um, though it does tie back very much to this vintage private equity concept, which is you really just want to be allocating or, or rebalancing a little bit of your portfolio very frequently. That's sort of like the core underlying concept of portfolio tranching or overlapping portfolios or any of the sort of names for the solution. But the basic idea is saying, Let's make it really, really simple here. Let's say I wanted to rebalance my portfolio once a year, right? Go back to that 60-40 and we just want to rebalance once a year because we don't want to deal with anything but long-term cap gains. But I still want to avoid this rebalance timing luck effect of, well, when did I rebalance in the year? One of the things you could do is you could almost think of taking a client's portfolio with that 60-40 and putting 25% of the capital in four different accounts. One of those accounts will rebalance every December and then not rebalance again until the next December. Another account might do it in March, another account in June, and the final account in September. And what happens is you keep going around those accounts, rebalancing, and you're rebalancing a different part of the overall portfolio every quarter, but it's only a, a small, it's only a smaller piece. It's 25%. 
And, and sort of in doing that, you're smoothing out that timing luck. You're, you're introducing a part of your portfolio that's rebalancing at all times. Um, and you can continue to increase the frequency. Maybe it's not four sub portfolios. Maybe it's 12 sub portfolios that do it monthly. Sort of the beneficial thing about being a systematic investor is we can do this daily in a mutual fund or an ETF. And it's really not a big deal. So we can do a lot of effort to try to control for these timing luck elements. But for someone trying to do it at home, the sort of math works out that for every sub portfolio they add, for every time they sort of divide it in half, they divide the timing luck in half. So if your timing luck is really big for your strategy and you just add one sub portfolio and split your capital in half, yeah. you've now cut your timing luck in half. You do it again. You know, you cut it in half again. So it's sort of that asymptotic decline that the first step is is the biggest one in, in cutting down the luck. Yeah. So the so the point the point just to circle back a little bit, I think the the point here is when allocators are making decisions about who to give uh, or or timing not not sorry not timing but who to give uh, money to and making assessments of uh, managerial skill. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely. not right. They're not necessarily paying attention to the actual timing differences that exist between the two managers, even though they both might be doing the same thing. The start time was different. Um, that's basically. I, think, I mean, that's a, that's a. It's. I mean, if you don't consider it, then you're you're making you're you're only making a decision with half of the information. I think a lot of emphasis is placed on trying to find the manager who's adding alpha. Yeah. And first of all, we, I won't even address whether historical alpha is predictive of future alpha, but there is this question of can historical alpha really be extracted from amongst peers when you have all these sort of randomness elements, uh, slight process differences that might have favored them, rebalance schedule frequencies that might have favored them. When in reality, I think most investors just want access to the style. They, they don't necessarily want the best value allocator. Um, it's almost impossible to pick that person. Adam might argue it is impossible to pick that person ex ante. But if you do want value, why not pick a couple of managers that perhaps approach the value question slightly differently? As an industry, I certainly see this among my clients. People don't want to have too many exposures in their portfolio. They think it's dilutive. When in reality, I think if you have a couple of value managers and you believe in value, then you might actually benefit from the process diversification, the rebalance diversification. You're controlling for all these unintended bets that you would be making and just picking one manager. And you might even be able to harvest a little rebalance premium from reallocating between them. So as CIOs making these allocation decisions, um, I mean, you're both, you're, you're both PMs and CIOs, uh, you know, you're both, you're making allocation decisions as well as your own investment decisions. Um, how do you, how do you go about, do you, are you able to unearth this, inf this data or this information from the managers you're considering? Do you ask or do you, is it a phone call or are you talking to them and, 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 you know, doing the detective work to find this out? Do you want me to dive in first, Adam? Yeah, I mean, you. You. This applies more directly. We we address it directly within the rebalancing of our of our own strategies. But I know you've incorporated this in terms of the product selection and the process diversity that you've introduced into your product. So maybe you sh you should go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. For us, it's a little bit of both. So there's parts of the portfolio. So we really manage one core portfolio. Uh, it's our risk managed U.S. U.S. growth strategy. And it's sort of this barbell approach where we try to allocate 50% of the portfolio to do really well asymmetrically when markets are up and 50% of the portfolio to do really well asymmetrically when markets are down. And we're willing to forego that space where markets are, are going sideways. In that component where we're trying to allocate for, for that positive market environment, we take a momentum tilt. And because we manage a mutual fund, it is very difficult for us to do momentum tilts and attacks conscious or tax efficient manner. And so what we do is we actually use a suite of ETFs. So we went out to the ETF marketplace and said, which ETFs are out there? When do they rebalance? 
What sort of signals are they looking at? How do they constrain individual securities? How do they constrain other factor exposures? How do they constrain industry or sector effects? And what we did is we chose four that we thought gave us the under a diversification in underlying processes that we thought were all supported academically and, and practically. We thought could all harvest the momentum premium over time, but would do so in different ways and rebalanced at different frequencies and schedules to try to create through a combination of those exposures, a more continuous turnover. Now, is it ideal? No, in my ideal world, I'd have all of them rebalancing continuously and I'd be equally allocating across all these underlying signals that they're using. But because I can't do that from a cost perspective, or at least a tax and transactional cost perspective, this is sort of the next best thing for us. Whereas in other parts of the portfolio, that defensive sleeve where we can actually pick high quality stocks and it's a lower turnover sleeve, we can actually run the rebalance schedule much more frequently. The underlying selection mechanism has an ensemble aspect to it. So we can sort of incorporate that process and uh, rebalance frequency diversification ourselves. So it's a little bit of both. Yeah. I'd say for our part that the um, since since we typically manage futures portfolios and or sort of cap weighted or more traditional passive um, ETF ETFs in our models that they're rebalancing between the ETFs and between the futures ends up being the um, the focus and there's a question of what the ideal rebalance horizon is to 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 maximize what you're getting from the underlying signals. And so one approach that we adopted several years ago was the idea of rebalancing a, a fraction of the portfolio on a daily frequency, another fraction on weekly, another fraction every two weeks, another fraction every three weeks, and another fraction every month. But not not just like every Friday or every two Fridays, but rather on every single day of the week, we're rebalancing some small fraction on either a daily, weekly, bi-weekly, tri-weekly, or monthly horizon. So we're spreading our bets to the greatest extent possible across all of these different rebalancing frequencies and, and at, on as a continuous a basis as, as possible um, to try to minimize some of this dispersion. But just in terms of trying to select managers, I mean, I think there's, there's so much variance in what we observe um, through time and, and the different returns and so many different opportunities for what seem to be very small decisions to have actually a really profound impact on performance from month to month and year to year. Um, if you're trying to allocate to a style, I would echo what Corey said, which is really you just want to get diversity across managers, processes, and hopefully um, rebalance timing to just minimize the chance of having bad luck and just maximize your chances of sort of triangulating on the underlying characteristics of the style that you're trying to harness. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think I, value is a stark example where you have priced a book as a, a, a particular measure that has gone through quite a change as balance sheets have changed and the way in which we sort of calculate value have changed. And if you're stuck in that one paradigm of looking at value through that, that lens, it can lead to pretty long and arduous periods of feeling left out even within your value tribe. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I was no just going to say, the, just um, go ahead, Adam. Sorry. Sorry. No, no doubt that the character of markets has, has changed and will, and will always change through time. And, um, so that means that different ways of, of measuring, um, characteristics that inform a certain style, um, will come in and out of favor and you just kind of want to diversify across a number of diff those different definitions in order to minimize the chances of just completely missing out. As Mike says, from price to book versus PE or price to sales or um, price to free cash flow or a variety of different other metrics mm -hmm. that you could use to measure value, diversifying across those different metrics is, is usually um, advantageous. Um, and that actually that idea of evolving market conditions, I think maybe a good segue to, I think what it, what's occupied a great deal of your time more recently, Corey, right? So maybe you can kind of dive into what you've spent the last year really focusing on in terms of your 
how you frame this idea of liquidity cascades. You wrote a paper on it, and I think some of your thinking has evolved. I want to just sort of walk through the major themes and what motivated you to begin researching this idea of liquidity cascades and what's involved there and how your thinking has changed. Yeah, and if you'll allow me while I uh, go ahead and prepare my tinfoil hat for the liquidity cascades <laughs> discussion, the sort of the last thing I would want to add to to this discussion of ensembling and, and diversification, I think value is a really great example where I think if a lot of people were to take the time and plot these different managers and their performance, what they would find is a bunch of managers who are in who are all truly value managers. If you were to plot their performance, it would sort of look like there's there's a dog walker who's walking all these dogs down the average path. And all of these managers, the dogs, are flying all over the place, but they're all sort of centered around the value style return. And so I think it becomes this question of, you know, again, as an allocator, are you ultimately looking for trying to pick the dog that's leading or pick the dog that's falling behind or going left or going right? Can Do you really want to deal with all that tracking error? Or do you just want sort of value on average? And I, and I think that's sort of a question individuals have to come to on their own. To go back yeah, to the you, point... You want uh, to get the gravitational mass of the guy walking those six dogs. Exactly. Not chasing the six, do- six dogs. Exactly. That's my view, at least. Uh, so, to, I mean, I was going to say, sorry, Corey, before you get started on liquidity cascades, I, I wanted to just make a point, just listening to... Um, the three of you, uh, actually, I, I just, it, it occurred to me that, you know, um, as portfolio managers, you're obviously competing for allocations yourself. And so that when you're being evaluated by allocators, you're hoping that, that the errors of timing evaluation that we're talking, that we've talked about for the last 10 minutes go in your favor. So you, you could be doing the exact same thing as your, as your peers. But just by some stroke of luck, either you did you made a better decision. You you were fortunate. I mean, not a better decision, but a more fortunate decision at a particular time than they did, or vice versa. It goes against you. Well, there's a very famous example of this, actually. I know I'm, I'm deferring the liquidity cascades, mm-hmm. but I, I think there's a very famous example that's worth acknowledging, which is research affiliates. Yeah, uh, had what was called the immaculate rebalance in 2009. And they happened to their, their fundamental investing methodology, the original index methodology that they followed, invest rebalance once a year. And they did it at a time that was sort of caught the perfect bottom in financials, as I recall. And this original paper that I found from these authors at Robico went back and said, well, what would have happened if they had rebalanced at the end of a different quarter? And the dispersion in return, I think, was something like 10 to 20 percentage points, right? And so they happened to catch the perfect rebalance. They looked like complete geniuses. That performance allowed them to raise a ton of assets. Now, to their credit, they then realized, oh, that was a big unintended bet we made that went our way, and they have since controlled for it. But that forever lives in their track record, and looks like alpha to the untrained eye, and it's not. And 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 so I think there's a lot of managers who are unaware of this. But any manager who's written a quarterly commentary has gone one quarter and gone, "Wow, uh, everything went against me at end of quarter." And if only I could write this commentary two weeks prior or two weeks later, my commentary would be totally different. Yeah. And that is to a certain extent a time of a type of timing luck. Um, but this is the type of stuff that I think these unintended bets that can creep into a portfolio are the types of things that can knock investors out of the business or they can capture a huge market share because sometimes they just get lucky, but it's unrepeatable. It's just complete luck with the exception of unless you believe in some sort of seasonality effects. So I just want to, I, I want to make sure we, we, we pull this thread all the way because we talk about this internally quite a bit and, um, and we make, an art of diversifying the the what, the how, and the when um, in all of our portfolios. And we talk about this a lot because if you sort of think through, again, just sort of um, using value style as an example, if you have a strategy that diversifies continuously, or sorry, that rebalances continuously, that diversifies across a wide variety of characteristics, so you're selecting for stocks, 
you know, some portion of your portfolio is selecting for stocks with high earnings price, others high sales price, others high cash flow price, et cetera. So you're diversifying across all these different axes. As you look at the performance through time, what you expect to observe is a strategy that is right down the middle of all of the other value funds that are taking a stronger view, you know? So you've got some value funds that exclusively do enterprise value EBITDA and others ex- exclusively do price to book. And they rebalance very strictly at the end of certain quarters or once a year or whatever, right? On any given year, some of those are going to have lucky events and others are going to have unlucky events. And the one that diversifies across all of those different dimensions every year is going to be right down the middle, of all of them, which means that you're never going to be at the top, right? You're never going to be at the bottom, but you're also never going to be at the top. So you're, from a manager standpoint, trying to raise assets, you end up actually shorting the optionality of good timing luck by trying to minimize the potential for bad timing luck. So you're trying to make a prudent decision on behalf of your investors, right? You want to get, extract the maximum amount of informational content maximize the signal to noise ratio, minimize the amount of unintended bets and variants, but you're selling this, this option on, on potentially being top quartile or top decile in any particular year. And it ends up because investors are, are largely uninformed and largely performance chase that you sell the optionality of having good luck and, and large flows as a function of that. So this ends up being prudence often from a man, from the perspective of the economics of an asset manager, um, not always working out to your benefit. It may, you expect it to work out to your benefit over the long term, but you're shorting a variety of call options along the way, which I think is an interesting. I, I think that's on. spot on. You're never the shiny object with this approach, right? And that is, right? So, you, so if I were to put my running an asset management firm hat on, I would say, Look, if I just if I just want that shiny object flow and I just want to maximize assets under management, I should probably launch a couple of products and hope for some good rebalance timing luck. But if you put your investment manager hat on and say, no, I want to make sure that there's no unintended bets, particularly no uncompensated unintended bets sneaking into the portfolio, because those ultimately can lead to negative realized performance that I, I don't want. Those can knock me out. So I, these are at odds and it's an interesting conflict. And you do see, for the most part, the industry continues to ignore this. Uh, I know this has been a huge area of focus for you too, Adam. By the way, if you figure out how to diversify across the the who and the where and the why and the which axes and let me know what those are, I'd, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> yep. Th- that sounds good. We'll write a, a paper on the on the principal components of all those different yeah, exactly. Uh, but but no, I I really think this is a because if you think about sort of the business model of of diversified asset managers, it kind of makes sense, right? You've got you've got a variety of different value managers, a variety of different growth managers. Really, what you're hoping for is that any given in any given quarter or year or three year period, you're going to have one or two managers that are going to happen to have gotten lucky, right? They're going to get a substantial amount of lucky flows. And we know that even once alert dollars are allocated to a manager, even when that manager goes on to underperform for a substantial period, a, a, a great majority of those assets stick around, right? So just attracting the assets in the first place, you're a long way towards winning the game. So, so, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a clever, but, but less scrupulous asset manager, I want to run, you know, eight different value funds and eight different growth funds and all of them have very different processes and at any given time by sheer luck you're going to have one that's going to be working really well that's going to be the shiny object that that and, and if you look around at the asset management industry you'll find that strangely that does look like the business model that the, that they're pursuing certainly so, the large asset managers well, especially this year with the explosion in thematic Right, the, the absolute explosion. It's not just totally yes. You know, you, you had the the low vol fascination, um, and then realization of the unintended bets there, and and then you have all the themes, everything from uh, crypto coins to um, uh, very very narrow sector pieces of the market, and uh, or, or super large cap areas of the market, and. Um, it, it may be a, a function to some degree of, of the speculative fervor in the market. I'm not sure. 
hate to even bother to say that because it always goes on much longer than anyone can anticipate, but certainly thematics and then those very specific rules, right? That, that here's my back test and here's the rules and, and the set of rules is, is very opportune for the particular history that we lived and the future history will not necessarily be that. So that becomes really hard. And then we also all know that assets chase after performance, generally speaking, unfortunately. And once you start to introduce leverage and convexity, these sort of effects just uh, absolutely explode in their type of impact. And so at least what's interesting to me is when you start talking about certain styles that may behave in a more asymmetric manner, right? Value as a style, most of the performance comes from a very short period of time. What's it, like, I think the best quote I heard about value is from Andrew Lapthorne at, at SockGen, who said value is a, a, a basket of the world's problems, but a call option on good news, right? And it's sort of like it, most of the time, it's just ugly stuff you don't want to own. And maybe you're not actually getting a risk premium, but when things look, when, when the future looks a little brighter than it did in the mm-hmm. past, value really explodes, but it tends to be very condensed. And which version of value explodes, right? That, that sort of difference, that convexity can lead to massive short-term dispersion. We implement uh, call options and put options in our portfolio. And when we rebalance those call and put options can be have a massive uh, impact on performance. If, if all of a sudden we go to sell some of our calls or our puts and the VIX has spiked, well, that might be very beneficial if we're looking to, to sell, but very, you know, can hurt us if we're looking to buy exposure. And we're not necessarily trying to time that. We just might be trying to roll exposure for other reasons. We might have had new cash come into the portfolio. We might have had redemptions. All of that ultimately impacts performance and is in many ways out of our control unless we take action to try to smooth out that impact over time. Now, you didn't um, use options for most of your career, this is a, a relatively new um, addition to your product suite. What this is a, a, a perfect segue, I think, to to a discussion of the liquidity cascades um, concept, right? So, what led you to want to introduce this type of convexity into portfolios, and and what did you identify about the the character of markets and how they had shifted over the last few years that motivated this move? Yeah, so let's let's rewind to March 2020. No one wants to relive it, but let's let's go back a little bit. Um, as an asset manager, prior to March 2020, our flagship portfolios were predominantly trend following portfolios that we had overlaid some fixed income exposure to. And the idea for us was most allocators we worked with had a traditional 60 40 portfolio that they rebalanced. And we said the maximum bang for your buck that we could introduce to the portfolio from a how-based diversification is going to be a trend-following strategy. And that's what we're going to try to do. Over time, we'd started to get questions from clients saying, the market feels different. The market seems different. It seems like it's moving further faster. And quantitatively, I was never really able to answer whether that effect was true, um, whether it's bearing out in the data, or why. And then as March 2020 came around in real time, one of the things that sort of became obvious to me, and again, this is all with the benefit of hindsight going through it, was it felt like we had an exogenous event that turned into an endogenous market event, that that the COVID crisis wasn't affecting markets in a very abnormal way, and then suddenly it was, and then markets seemed to move much further faster then the fundamentals really would have justified. Now, who, who am I to say what the fundamentals should or should not justify? All I can say is fixed income liquidity totally broke down. Uh, leverage within ETFs seemed to be driving a tremendous amount of end of day buying and selling volume. Uh, option dealers tended, seemed like they were moving markets dramatically based on the amount of hedging they were having to do. And you looked at, more esoteric markets like the dividend swap or dividend futures markets, they were completely broken from a liquidity perspective. And so it seemed like there was this shock to markets that caused the entire market structure to unwind very violently uh, in a way that as a trend follower was almost impossible to navigate. And then we got this sort of uh, 
rebound in markets that we did certainly have massive central bank intervention, but it seemed like a lot of these systemic effects, these endogenous systemic effects that had sort of all fallen apart into the end of March were all rapidly rebuilding themselves back up and you got this huge bounce in markets. And so I walked away from March saying, I think I'm missing a big piece of the puzzle. I think markets have changed. Now, yes, markets are always changing, right? There's no way I can sit here in 2021 and say markets are the same as they were in 1999, but it doesn't necessarily mean the means by which you invest should necessarily change, right? If my belief is that I'm taking advantage of some sort of investor bias, do I think humans have changed? Maybe not. Um, but has something in markets fundamentally changed that makes my process no longer relevant? And so I went down this full research project of qualitatively, which makes me very uncomfortable as a systematic quant, but qualitatively trying to ask the question, what is driving markets today? And I'm happy to go into that, but it led me down some some strange rabbit holes. I will say sort of my rule of thumb was, Anytime I ended up at zero hedge, that was sort of the end of that rabbit hole. I wasn't willing to go any further. But what emerged were, were sort of a f- three big narratives. Um, one, central banks were now influencing markets in a destabilizing manner. Two, passive had grown to be such a big component of markets that it was now destabilizing markets. And then three, there was this asymmetry in market liquidity that was occurring during a crisis. Because on the one hand, you had high frequency traders that were not required by law to show up. And on the other hand, you had this growing scope of what we'll call volatility contingent players who are making trades either very explicitly in volatility markets or trades that are highly correlated to what's going on in volatility markets that were demanding a lot of liquidity when the high frequency traders were disappearing. And so those were like the three major narratives. And so the paper was an exploration of how those narratives are playing out. Was there any data supporting them? And ultimately, did I think personally they were sufficient to to drive the change in market behavior? One of the um, more fascinating dimensions of that paper, I think, is the um, section on the impact of passive flows and... um, I know you and I have explored this at length and with, with Mike uh, Green and who was sort of the progenitor of this idea, but maybe let's, let's start there. What did you discover about the impact of passive flows that, that might surprise, um, many people who haven't explored this topic at length? So the pun fully intended I use, by the way, with Mike Green and feel free to steal this is that he's been at the vanguard of this topic for years, but he really has. He he was the one who really <laughs> introduced it to me. Thank you. I appreciate the golf clap. This idea, <laughs> right, that that passive is somehow distorting markets is hugely controversial. And as I've come to see it, there's actually sort of three sub-arguments. So I'll start with Mike's and then I'll actually talk about the other ones as well. Mike's sort of core argument is that When you have a market move from traditional active investing to passive investing, what you're ultimately doing is introducing a potentially divergent um, trade into the market expressed through market flow. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say I buy passive S&P 500 exposure today. I would go out to the market. And the market makers would fill me in sort of that market cap weighted exposure to the S&P 500. And at the end of the day, the weights in my portfolio are going to be equal to my starting weights drifted by the relative performance of the underlying securities. Now, that's not momentum necessarily, right? They just happen to drift relative. And if I continue to hold that portfolio ignoring sort of what happens at, you know, yearly reconstitution and that sort of stuff with with the S&P committee, I'm just getting the drift of that portfolio, which passive people would argue that drift is all governed by active players. What we have to consider, though, is let's say tomorrow, Adam, you go in and buy the S&P 500 with your money that you're putting in your savings account. 
Well, the weights at which you're buying at are now the weights at which I bought but drifted based on relative performance. So the money you're putting to work is now buying more of the stuff that recently went up and less of the stuff that recently went down. Pierre, let's say you do it the day after. Again, your money is going to go more to the stuff that went recently up, less to the stuff that went recently down. And so the question is, can that passive flow over time that's just buying in proportion to how things have evolved actually create a wedge? That there's such strength in that flow that the recent winners end up getting bid up more than the recent losers, creating this self-fulfilling prophecy between the haves and the have-nots in the market. And I think a lot of it comes down to a question of, is market liquidity ultimately proportional to relative market cap? Does Apple have, I don't know, 6,000 times the underlying liquidity of Under Armour? just because its market cap is 6,000 times larger. And I think that's still an open question, but it's a really interesting and nuanced debate. Corey, yeah, doesn't doesn't the whole action as well almost double, well, maybe not double, but it enhances in its impact as Adam not only went to buy the current, Pierre bought the current allocation, but if they had cash that they had earned somehow, fine, there was no selling. But in most cases, there is actually on the other side of the market cap portfolio, a portfolio that is non-market cap, that has a structure of different assets that it's owned, that is being sold. And thus, really what the investor is experiencing is a transition from some sort of active where they have a different composition of a stocks and index to a market cap composition thereby at the same time selling a group of stocks that is not widely owned, that doesn't have the depth of an index bias to it, at the same time as they're buying into this construct of current drift. That That's spot on, right? Because most people aren't going from passive to passive. They're going from active to passive. And so there's actually two important components there. One is exactly what you pointed out, which is their they have implicit over and under weights that they're trying to unwind. Now, that is going to require someone on the other side of the trade, but the person on the other side of the trade can sort of set that marginal price. So if we, for example, think of the world as value investors versus growth investors, and every value investor wants to unwind, the growth investors are going to sit there and say, bring your prices to us, right? And, and what that'll ultimately do is drive the, the passive market more towards how growth investors are oriented. So you don't have to see growth investors necessarily capitulate. They can just set prices in a way that the value portfolio ends up continually punishing the value stocks lower and lower and lower, pricing up the growth stocks higher and higher and higher um, to the point where ultimately the value investors and the growth investors own the same portfolio. The second really interesting nuance is this idea that if you look at traditionally allocated active portfolios, historically, like an active mutual fund, would have held between 1% to 3% in cash. And if we look at a modern ETF, we see that that's closer to 10 basis points of cash. And this includes in, uh, like a passively indexed fund. So we don't even have to talk about going from active to true passive. This could be your active uh, value manager to a value ETF, for example. And if we have the entire world move from these mutual funds that have 2 or 3% cash to ETFs that have 10 basis points of cash, well, that's a huge amount of cash that now needs to be put to work in the market. And the only way that you can have that cash be put to work in the market is if the value of the market goes up. So one argument potentially for structurally higher P.E. ratios in the modern era is that we've moved to, an, to a situation where there's structurally more demand because the vehicles we're now implementing with are more cash efficient. I think it's important to um, acknowledge that moving from 3% cash to 10 basis points cash is not a 2.9% change. It is a 30 times change, right? right. And, and so, 
the the elasticity of demand to absorb that 30 times delta in cash it it, it suggests that we could have this massively convex um character to the move to the to the to the moves in price of the market overall in order to accommodate this move from traditional active to to passive funds and i know that's been a major thrust of mike's uh, of mike's argument yeah and so you that's, start that's the source of all the that's the source of the distortion that's being caused by passive flows well there's a couple more potentials right yeah. so so some of it is this idea of okay you've got more money moving from active to passive you have that pushing up structural demand in the markets you have active to passive potentially embedding a divergent momentum type demand flow into markets you also have this interesting dynamic of moving from active mutual funds to to etfs where the actual market structure has now changed the microstructure has changed where if you were to give me a dollar as a mutual fund manager, I'm going to get that dollar in my cash report and I'm going to have to go to the exchange and buy the securities I want. Or if someone redeems, I'm going to have to sell the securities. The way it works with an ETF is assuming it's a sufficient amount of capital, you're going to go to the exchange and there's going to be a market maker who's going to see your order and then go to the ETF fund company and say, Give me shares of the fund in exchange. I'm going to go out and buy up all the underlying in the right proportion. Give them to you. You give me the shares of the fund. I'll now go to the exchange and sell it to this individual. And what that ultimately does is it means the person buying and selling doesn't really care about the value of anything. They just care about the price of the basket, right? And so all they're trying to do is track that basket as closely as possible and when everything starts trading in baskets that are all these ETFs are rebalancing twice a year, right? Again, even these active ETFs may be rebalancing quarterly. You end up with not only passive flow embedded within those ETFs, um, but you end up with tighter structural links between the way securities trade. That every time Apple trades, JP Morgan also trades. And so you're increasing the correlation of those securities because you're eliminating all the sort of fundamental participants in the order book. Yeah, think think about the you get the dollar in as a mutual fund, an active yeah. manager, and you're thinking about in your portfolio. I'm price sensitive, meaning I'm, I might be value sensitive or I might be some future cash flow of growth sensitive. And so you're going to apportion that through your portfolio to what you believe are your best ideas at the moment based on, you know, the, the, the volatility of the market and looking at the different pieces of the market and you're price sensitive or you're price sensitive based on some set of rules, whether they're in your head or on a piece of paper. Whereas the, uh, ETF is not price sensitive. It is execute my allocation to this ETF, which has this construct of portfolio exposures at any basket price today, basically. I missed the yeah. fundamentals. An, an active manager doesn't need to deploy that cash right away, right? He can, he can keep that cash mm -hmm. in, in, uh, on, in the fund for a few days or some weeks or however long he needs to in order to find good ideas to allocate to. The ETF manager must, by regulation, allocate those funds immediately in, in order to um, not have any cash at the end of the day. So, so you can see the active manager having sort of a counter cyclical impact on markets. Money comes in, it goes through the filter of their brain. They say, I want to buy these five securities because they are cheap based on my model or they're for whatever they are, what they are that qualifies for me. Therefore, I will put them there. And there's someone sitting on that decision who is more counter cyclical than pro cyclical to the market potentially. Whereas in an ETF world, you're basically a hundred percent pro cyclical. There's no price sensitivity. That order needs to be executed because the, the paramount condition is tracking the index. I'm not That's the a objective bit, but, function. Yeah. Um, have you guys, Corey or maybe Mike too, like, have you guys given any thought to, how this phenomenon may be playing out in terms of the transparent active ETFs, just thinking sort of ARC, for example, um, the fact that 
I assume they also need to completely deploy every new dollar of of invest of investment. Um, the same she, day, she has more flexibility on that. Okay, so, so it's Kathy transparent has, but not index based, right? Okay, yeah. and she can change her basket midday. And the interesting thing about mm-hmm. these authorized participants is there's an argument actually they can act a little bit as a stabilizer because they have their own balance sheets. So if ARC needs to eliminate a position from their portfolio really quickly, they can push it onto the authorized participants and they deal with over 20 authorized participants who can then act as a bit of a capacitor where they can hold that for days, weeks. They might keep it on their balance sheet. They might be able to offload it to someone else who's looking to buy. So there, there's this Hedge interesting- with a basket of other securities. Exactly. There's a very interesting way in which you could argue, look, is a mutual fund manager's best use of their time execution? Wouldn't it be better to work with an authorized participant who is an expert market maker in some ways? And so I think there's this interesting area where actively managed ETFs could, in theory, be the best of both worlds if, if you sort of get that basket construction done well. And they've changed the tax rules on those, I think, haven't they, right? So that the active... Um, funds or get the same tax treatment as a passive funds, which wasn't the yes. case for the yep. longest time. So that's, I believe so. that's amazing. I believe so. Um, so the, the last piece, if I can just add of, of the yeah, passive please. debate, because there is one last piece, which is this idea of accessing markets passively is ultimately going to change the way underlying markets work, right? So we saw this historically with commodities. In, in the mid-1990s, Goldman Sachs launched their passive commodity index got adopted very heavily by institutions in the early 2000s. And that actually fundamentally changed how the underlying commodities behaved, um, both the type of volatility they were exhibiting, as well as their correlation to other markets. So those securities or those, those commodities that were featured most heavily in the commodities basket ended up seeing a dramatic increase in correlation to U.S. equity markets and even global equity markets because you had these volatility spillover effects. Because when everyone was putting them in as an asset allocation, when they rebalanced, it meant there was capital sloshing back and forth. So the relative performance of equities versus commodities all of a sudden had an impact on the commodities themselves. Now, so how does this tie back to passive? Well, one of the things we should acknowledge in the modern era is a huge amount of investors are now accessing markets passively as a savings vehicle through target date funds. So in the U.S., we've seen the target date fund industry go from a sub $10 billion industry in the early 2000s to a something probably close to $2.5 trillion industry today. And a lot of that, the most the qualified default is going to be a fairly passive exposure especially at the asset allocation level, that's going to sit on a fixed glide path. And so, again, we would expect the market, if we said the majority of of relative dispersion between stocks and bonds over time is going to be fundamentally driven, well, now all of a sudden we have a huge proportion of assets being put in a vehicle that is rebalancing on a very fixed schedule, on a very set glide path, and that glide path is really independent of the underlying fundamental variable change. So there was a paper published last year that demonstrated that as we have seen more adoption of these fixed rebalanced target date funds in the U.S., we have seen the trendiness of U.S. equities decline. That sort of the pre-2010 era was there was a lot of trends that occurred between stocks and bonds. And the post-2010 era was one of mean reversion between stocks and bonds, seemingly coinciding with this rise of target date. Because every time equities outperform bonds, you now have this huge amount of capital that's selling equities to buy bonds and vice versa. And so the passive access to certain markets, depending on how how those rules play out, can actually have a really profound impact on the underlying markets themselves. Love it. Um, There was one other dimension that played out um, in full view in in. Um, February, March of 2020, as you mentioned, that came down to both the explicit and implicit volatility traders. So I want to make sure we cover that and, and go into how that motivated you to begin to introduce these sort of convexity profiles into your core strategies. Yeah, so this was a, a huge part 
um, this idea of like asymmetric liquidity. It actually didn't even start. My research didn't start with with these volatility contingent players, as I'll call them. I was going down the rabbit hole of, oh, high frequency is bad and they pull their liquidity and that's the big problem. What I ultimately found there, which I thought was really interesting, was it does seem like liquidity from high frequency traders does get pulled in a crisis. And it seems like there's two reasons for it. One, there's just less of them today. There's maybe six major players, and they've all sort of homogenized their models because they keep acquiring competition, right? So as you decrease um, the heterogeneity of the population of liquidity providers, they all end up you know, pulling capital at the same time when they need to. The second piece is that they're all capacity constrained. They all operate with a huge amount of leverage. And a lot of that leverage is achieved by posting collateral in the form of securities. Well, if those securities decrease in value as the market sells off and or become more volatile, the amount of capital they have access to goes down and so you get this pro-cyclical decline in the amount of liquidity they're able to provide. So as an example of that, I can give a practical example and then an academic example. A practical example is Virtu uh, Financial, one of the largest market makers out there who acquired KCG, which had been a mix of Knight Capital and, and Getco uh, prior to that. In March 20th last year, did a capital raise of $450 million. Now, most people didn't even see this um, because it sort of flew under the radar of everything else that was going on, but they were trying to do a capital raise of $450 million because they were saying they were so capital constrained, they needed the extra money to keep providing liquidity to markets. Not that they didn't want to, it's that they literally couldn't because they didn't have the money. And then following this, there was a paper that was published that said, okay, if the argument is that these high frequency traders are liquidity constrained, one of the things we would actually see in markets is that when liquidity deteriorates, if it really is because of the cap capacity constraints of these high frequency traders, it would deteriorate most acutely in the most liquid sort of index constituent names that these high frequency traders uh, operate in. Uh, most frequently. And that is exactly what the paper found, that once you hit these sort of market transitions, it's actually the most prior, most liquid names that are most impacted by these liquidity constraints. So you have this part of the story where you have, okay, all these liquidity constrained providers. But then the question is, well, who cares? Right? Okay, they're liquidity constrained. Like, why is that a big deal? And it's a big deal because there's this huge other base of capital that's all demanding liquidity at the same time. And so I call these people the volatility contingent players. Um, and again, this is not for me something that I invented. This has been well sort of discussed and, and documented by, by people like Veneer Bonsali and Chris Cole and Ben Eifert and tons of other people who have been talking about this for a long time. And this space is filled with a couple different types of people. Uh, the first is those people who are on the hunt for yield, and they're operating in an environment of low interest rates. They're trying to find excess return, and they're doing so by selling call options or selling put options. So covered call strategies or, or, or cash secured put underwriting strategies. Institutions might be selling variance swaps. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which they would try to sort of harvest the volatility risk premium. But ultimately, what they're doing is they are selling vol um, into the into vol markets. And what's important to realize here is that there is someone on the other side of that trade. And the person on the other side of that trade is typically an options dealer. And so Adam, if you said, okay, I want to sell a call to harvest some premium, and I'm on the other side of that trade as an options dealer, and I buy the call, I'm sitting there going, I don't really actually want to be long a call option, right? I don't want to make a directional trade on markets. I just was trying to make that bid ask spread. So what do I do? I try to hedge out my exposure. And one of the ways you can hedge out that exposure is I can go to the underlying security and start trading it short. So if I am long a call option, I have a certain amount of exposure to the underlying market and I'll start shorting out that exposure. If the market starts going up because options are Asymmetric, asymmetric instruments, 
right? They've got that positive convexity to them. I'm going to have to short more. So every time the market goes up, I start shorting more. Every time the market goes down, I can buy back some of my short. So all that call overwriting actually has sort of a volatility um, reducing impact on the market. Conversely, you might be buying puts, right, to protect you on the downside. And I'm selling you those puts. Now, most of the time, they might be so far out of the money, I don't really care. I don't have to do much with my hedge. But if the market starts to go down and I go, oh, no, I'm going to owe Adam some money, I'm going to start shorting the market to cover my position. And as the market goes down further, I'm going to keep shorting. And as it keeps going down, I'm going to keep shorting. If the market goes up, I can buy back some of my short. So now all of a sudden, I'm volatility contributing. I'm chasing the market. So what we have is in very normal markets, these volatility contingent players that are reducing volatility. And then in extreme markets, you have them contributing to volatility. The second set are, are people that really came uh, into popularity post-2008 because there was a ton of investors who were looking for capital preservation. So these are the people who are uh, hunting for safety. And these are the, all the sort of CTAs, risk parity, uh, variable annuity target, uh, target volatility, variable annuity players, relative momentum, trend following, all that sort of stuff that might not be directly linked to volatility. But a lot of their behavior is very highly correlated. So when markets start to sell off or realize volatility goes up, a lot of these players are going to degross, sell some of their position, cover some of their position, whatever it is. It's very pro-cyclically tied to what's happening in those markets. So what you get, and the way I've sort of seen it play out, is you have all of these institutions trying to harvest this yield, which is sort of artificially suppressing market volatility because of the behavior of the option dealers. Every time the market goes up, the option dealers sell. Every time the market goes down, the option dealers buy. This artificial suppression of market volatility leads the whole second group of players to increase their exposure to equities. They go, oh, realize volatility is really low. Things are calm. Let's buy. And buying drives the trend positive. And that ends up inviting all the momentum players and the trend followers. And suddenly, everyone gets really levered long equities. Way more exposure than they should probably have. And then there's some sort of exogenous shock like COVID. And suddenly, everyone wants out of the pool. And it leads to this massive pro-cyclical decline where everyone's trying to sell. It's driving up volatility. All of a sudden, the option dealers are trying to hedge their puts. So they're chasing the market in both directions, driving up volatility further. And it, everything becomes this chaotic sort of cascade where head, high frequency traders have pulled the liquidity. You've got this huge spike in demand for liquidity uh, and it becomes utter chaos until either everyone sort of sold everything and or someone steps in like a central bank to try to stabilize markets again. Yeah. That, every Fantastic. time I hear that, it's just incredibly <clears throat> compelling. How have you um, altered the way that you manage money in the face of what you have now come to understand? So there's sort of two ways I position this. The first I would say is given this thesis of liquidity cascades, as a tactical manager, I think you can take two approaches. You can either say things are moving faster, and so I can play an increasingly fast game of whack-a-mole, or I can try to embed some other forms of structural diversification in my portfolio that should do well in these types of environments. And so ultimately, I think number one just leads to an arms race. If everyone decides to go faster and faster, it just makes these unwinds faster and faster. I think the second is just going back to that core thesis we talked about at the beginning of structurally diversifying what, how, and when. So for us at Newfound, we said, you know, we want to take our portfolio and really split it into this barbell. We think markets are going up faster than they ever have, and we think they're going down faster than they ever have. We want half the portfolio dedicated to doing really well in these positive environments, half dedicated to doing really well in these negative environments. And the way we're going to go about achieving that, we're going to try to diversify. So our in our positive environment, for example, we're going to use some momentum tilts within the equities 
But for those really extreme positive environments, we also want to have a ladder of call options on the S&P 500 that sort of act like lottery tickets for us. We think the market just is more likely to float uh, positively, and so we want to have that convexity to outperform because, again, we think the market sort of has that inclination to do it. On the other hand, on the downside, we might have um, defensive high quality low vol stocks that we buy on, on that sort of defensive half of the barbell and we're going to buy out of the money put options that most of the time will ex, you know sort of expire worthless for us but act like a bit of an insurance policy um, when markets are going down that we can then hopefully become a liquidity provider in monetizing those positions we can then step in rebalance our portfolio and be buyers of equities when everyone else is a forced seller Love it. Um, you've been revising some of the, your your thinking a little bit. Obviously, I mean, you're we're constantly learning and we're observing market behavior and new literature is coming out, etc. Any um, follow on thinking as your um, as things have evolved over the last year or so since you wrote the paper? You know, my tongue in cheek follow on thinking has sort of been this idea that whenever we don't know why the market's moving we always have some economic narrative. But whenever we know for certain why the market's moving, it's always some over-levered player, some supply and demand imbalance. It's game stops, gamma, squeeze, and short squeeze. It's the Archegos forced liquidation. And I think what is becoming more rapidly apparent to me is it's more likely that all of these day-to-day -day moves are really independent of the, the macroeconomic narrative that might be the catalyst for some of it, but most of what's happening really is these these repositionings, reliquidations, um, rolling of option positions that are leading to hedging within markets. You start to see some of these funds that have gotten really big with very scheduled rebalanced uh, frequencies in their options, and you can start to see some of the knock-on effects intraday of what's happening when markets are illiquid. And so for me, the thinking has continued to evolve into the GameStop is not the anomaly. GameStop is what's been happening all along. No, I think that's exceptional and insightful. Um, <laughs> it is. I, well, I, I mean, the, the only the only other question I would have would be um, thinking of how we've seen sort of the larger economic regimes roll out and just looking at how we've seen sort of the inflationary growth dynamics start to take hold, some worries about supply chain disruption and some demand coming on back back online, and then the, the capital flows we've actually seen into those less well-liked sectors. So there, there has to be some, obviously this is a very dynamic field and we're talking at the margins how things are changing and adjusting. So it's not like the whole world has moved to this model. It's just that at the margin, small changes like this actually have pretty big impacts. Um, I, I think that's part of the answer, but I, I do want to get your thoughts on how, how do we see all these sort of value stocks, Russell 2000, the oil and gas sort of industry really performing so well. Where are those, gosh darn it, where are those fund flows coming from, uh, Corey, just based on everything that you just told me? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, we have seen, if you track fund flows over the last six months, there has been an enormous amount of flow into value. And it's hard to say precisely where that's coming from other than non-value. It does seem, if you look at ETF flows, min vol, low vol has been just a real loser over the last year from a flow perspective. Arguably, a lot of the positive flow into value seems like rebalance flow that people just keep going, okay, my value position just keeps getting smaller. I have to harvest some from my growth and keep rebuying value. That is that is some of it. But I think there's a big reopening trade. Uh, reflation trade is, is a big part of it that people are tactically positioning for a value resurgence. And again, I think what's interesting is some of this systematic flow can be supportive of that, that we're mm -hmm. seeing momentum strategies move away from profitable tech names into, and I don't use this word disparagingly, but this is just sort of how it's classified, like junkier value names. Value is definitively not quality today. It's this sort of reopening, high risk, um, junkier balance sheet type play. And a lot of momentum flow is starting to move into that. So that doesn't just mean momentum 
explicitly as a category, but anyone who incorporates momentum. So multi-factor quants would start picking that up more heavily. And, and I think that sort of plays out interestingly into media. So there's this idea of social media gamma and media gamma that once you start to hear the media talk about it, oh, now all of a sudden that might invite some more sort of behaviorally systematic flow. Anyone who's a value investor but looking for a catalyst, now all of a sudden, oop, it's bottomed. It's starting to pick back up. There's a catalyst to start being a buyer. And so all of a sudden you can see these sort of either explicitly systematic or sort of you know, behaviorally systematic flows migrate into value. And then if you go back to our passive thesis, if they are the relative outperformers, all those passive flows may then continue to be supportive of them continuing to be relative outperformers. Nice. Interesting. That's a good place to, to wrap it unless someone else has um, follow on questions. Uh, well, we do have one more question. Yep. One more question. So it's a uh, very technical question um, for you, Corey. Um, would you rather spend a week in the past or a week in the future? Do I get to change the past or just spend a week in the past? Actually, if you want to get it down to the brass tacks, it's it's your past and your future. Oh boy, <laughs> past. I would I would absolutely spend a week in the past. I don't want to know my future. I don't. I think that's yeah. that's the fun of living. And I think going back to the past, there are some phenomenal experiences that I've had that I would love to relive again. That I think, even if they replayed exactly as they did, just uh, refresh my memory as to how wonderful they were, I think that would be an unbelievable experience. The chance to relive your wedding a second time would just be exceptional. And I'll leave the future a mystery. Nice. Yeah. Love that. There, there, there's from a guy who's only been <laughs> married once. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Corey. That was great. Well, thank you guys for having me. Always, always fun chatting. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's a awesome. Corey, I hope right. we can uh, do this again uh, soon, and um, you know we can uh, get back to we can get back together again to um, see how things have changed from now, then, and um, continue the discussion. That was great. Be my pleasure. I look forward to it. Thank you.